Welcome back everyone. So up until this point we've been talking about uh, actual neurobiology and um, neurochemistry. So now we're going to actually do a little bit of a change of pace. We're going to switch from focusing mostly on the systems to focusing mostly on the senses. So for the next several weeks we're going to be focusing on senses. Um, so today we're going to start discussing uh, primarily what overall senses, you know, what the sensory systems look like, what they're made up of. And then in subsequent letter, lectures this week, we're going to talk about touch, um, hearing, the vestibular system. So we'll get into some of those systems and how all these components that you've been learning about actually work together to um, create the sensory, the sensory sensations that you are familiar with. So one thing that I already know you guys are probably thinking is, oh shoot, two chapters, countless sensory systems, I can't do all this because you're used to doing just one chapter a week and now you're going to get two chapters a week for a little while. My advice on this is take a 40,000 foot perspective, meaning look at the big picture. Also pay particular attention to the things I present because those are the things I really want you to know. So if you do this, if you focus mostly on the big picture, um, focus on what I present during the lectures, as well as in class, you should be fine with this. So it is a lot of information, we're going a little faster, but also I have taken that into account. So the questions are usually a little less specific. So today we been at, begin a two week uh, series of lectures that discusses perception and sensation. And we're kicking it off by discussing touch perception and pain. So first, before I get into touch perception, I want to talk a little bit about sensory processes and sensory systems. So the sensory process begins at the sensory receptor organ. Whether that's a rod or a cone in vision or a Merkel's disc in touch, it, it's what detects the stimulus. And this is whether the stimulus be chemical, uh, light, etc. Whatever that stimulus is. So there are receptor cells, and these are the cells that are within the organ that are responsible for transforming the stimulus uh, in whatever form it may come in, into a neural impulse. So that's all your receptor cell is. It's something that detects the stimulus and transforms it into a neural impulse. An adequate stimulus is essentially what determines what a sensory system can and cannot detect. So an adequate stimulus is the type of stimulus that a sensory organ is particularly adapted for. So for instance, light is the adequate stimulus for your eyes. You get visual sensations through rubbing your eyes, like I don't know if you've noticed, but if you close your eyes and you rub them, a lot of times you kind of, you see things. So that's a visual stimulation, but that's not an adequate stimulus because it isn't the stimulus your eye was adapted to sense. Um, another component of this is that sensory systems have a restricted range that they can detect. For instance, elephants can hear lower frequencies and cats can hear higher frequencies than humans. So this also goes into the um, adequate stimulus where there are only certain ranges that an animal is made to detect. So it's not just the type of sensory input, but it's also the range that has to be proper in order for an adequate stimulus to be adequate and be, to be sensed. So since sensory signals are just action potentials by the time they reach the brain, how are we able to differentiate them? The answer is through the concept of labeled lines, which says that the brain recognizes distinct senses because the signal travels along separate nerve tracts. Think of it like a network that's connected by cables. The brain knows what sensory information is on each given cable, and through this it knows where that information is coming from. This is also important with thin systems such as touch. Um, in the touch system, you'll see that there are several different types of receptors. There are pain receptors, stretch receptors, uh, vibration, and just normal touch receptors. Each of these types of receptors travel a slightly different tract. 
which results in the brain being able to differentiate them and attributing the proper sensation to the proper receptor. So how do touch signals get transformed into neural signals? Or how do any sensory signal get transformed into a neural signal? So this is done through a process that's called sensory transduction which is the process of converting a stimulus into action potentials. So how this is done is through generator potentials, which are local changes in the membrane potential due to the opening of ion channels. So thus, generator potentials are very similar to those excitatory postsynaptic potentials that we've discussed previously. So what you see here is that you have a brief um, change in the um, charge of the cell due to ion channels opening that is in response to the size of the stimulus. So if you have a weaker stimulus, it creates less than a moderate stimulus. So while the size of the action potential is the same regardless of the stimulus strength, what you see is that these generator potentials are proportionate to the stimulus strength and you need an adequate stimulus in order to reach the proper potential, the threshold, to have the action potential. So that's how this works. As you'll see in each sensory system, it's done by a little different process. But the main thing to focus on is that there's this sensory transduction. It's the process by which the receptor cell converts that energy into a, um, a neural impulse. And it's done through generator potentials. So, how do we know the strength of a stimulus um, if all we have are action potentials? As I just mentioned, action potentials are always the same amplitude. So, how do we know if something's stronger or weaker than something else? Well, there are a couple ways that this is done. One is coding. So, coding is um, the pattern of action potentials in a sensory system that reflect the stimulus. So, I think this is easiest understood with an example. So in coding, a single neuron can actually convey the intensity of a stimulus by changing the frequency of its action potentials. So how quickly it's firing tells you how strong the stimulus is. There's also range fractionation. So what that is, is that different neurons are responsible for detecting different frequencies. And this helps create a range of signals um, because only one cell can only detect so much variation due to limits in its firing frequency. So with that, what you often will see is um, different receptor cells being responsible for different parts of the spectrum. So here we have it where we have certain thresh or certain neurons that fire with a low threshold, so they're more sensitive. Then you have medium threshold where they fire for the medium ones but not the low ones. And lastly, a high threshold where it takes a lot to get these to fire. So with this, you can determine the strength of the stimulus based on which neurons you're hearing from. If you're hearing from just the low threshold, you know it's a pretty low stimulus, whereas if you have responses from all three, you know it's a pretty powerful stimulus that you're dealing with. So now that we've talked broadly about sensation, we turn our attention to the somatosensory system. And in this video, I'm going to talk a little bit about this. We're actually going to talk about the system a lot more in the second video, but I wanted to touch on this a little bit because there are certain aspects of it that are similar with other sensory systems, so I wanted to include it in my general overview of sensory systems. So briefly, since we are on somatosensory, I'll describe some of it. So the somatosensory system is responsible for detecting touch and pain throughout the body. Now one important trait about the somatosensory cells is adaptation, which is the progressive loss of response to a maintained stimulus. An example of this is your clothing. You wear your clothes all day, but you're likely rarely aware of them unless something binds or some, for some reason your attention is drawn to it. Same with jewelry. 
um, you wear these all the time. So because of this, you don't need to know all the time that your watch is still there or that your ring is still there. So over time, what happens is that um, the cells become less and less affected by that, and they stop firing in response to that um, to that stimulus. So with this, um, you could argue that part of this is due to attention. That you know, because these things aren't salient, you're not focusing on them, and you'd be right to an extent. But there's more to it. Um, adaptation helps in detecting change, which is likely more evolutionarily salient than the status quo. So with that, you know, what's, again, thinking of evolution, typically you're more worried about the things that are changing and not the things that are staying the same. So you want to know if there's a new predator in the environment, not if that tree is still over there. So a lot of our sensory systems, and touch is very much the same way, are adapted to detect change. And um, this, anything that's the same kind of gets blurred away over time. We'll see this a lot with vision. When we get there, you'll, you'll see this again. So again, looking at um, going back to touch and um, somatosensory, there are differences in ad adaptation between um, receptors, which lead to two different categories. You have tonic receptors. These shows, um, show slow or no decline in action potential frequency. So in other words, these have almost no to no adaptation at all. Whereas you have phasic receptors, which demonstrate adaptation by having a decrease in the frequency of action potentials. So these are the ones where when you're wearing a watch and you always have the watch on, they stop responding as much um, in response to that because it's not changing. Whereas the tonic receptors stay the same. So each sensory system has a distinct sensory pathway in the brain. And we'll, we'll, sorry about that. We'll talk about, actually, let me go and restart that. So each sensory system has a different sensory pathway in the brain, and it passes through stations during processing. So most pathways we'll see pass through regions of the thalamus. So the thalamus is kind of like a relay station to all the different sensory areas that need to there where the information is processed in the brain. And then pathways terminate up in the cerebral cortex, so up in the part up here where a lot of the higher level processing is going to be happening. So receptive fields, these, um, you have receptive fields for many different sensory systems, but I think touch it makes the most sense. So a receptive field is the space in which a stimulus will alter a neuron's firing. So what that means is it's basically the stimulus region that features, um, the, sorry, the stimulus region and features that affect the activity of the cell in a sensory system. So essentially, it's the amount of area that a sensory cell covers. So receptive cells can either be excitatory in the center with an inhibitory surrounding, or they can be inhibitory in the center with excitatory surroundings. Um, the inhibitory area helps, um, the reason why we have this, is it actually helps us detect edges or fine details more precisely. So that's why it's, sometimes important to have that um, inhibitory area as well. For each sense, as you'll see, there's a primary sensory cortex, and there's often a secondary sensory cortex as well. The primary sensory cortex is the region of the cortex that receives most of the information from the thalamus. The secondary sensory cortex, also sometimes known as the non-primary sensory cortex, receives its main input from the primary cortical area for that modality. So the primary sensory cortex gets the information first, starts the processing, and then the secondary sensory cortex will do subsequent processing. And you'll see these differ a little bit from sensory system to sensory system, but it works in this way that the primary gets the information first, 
passes it along to the, the secondary sensory cortex.